We all know that cardiology is the most competitive fellowship, but what we don't know specifically is what are the exact steps that it takes to get seen and to get matched, especially as an international medical graduate. Everybody tells you do research, network, away rotation, be a good student, be a chief resident, but you did all these things, you hit summit and silence. Not a single reply from Iras. So the question is, how do people like myself, who got 16 plus interviews, do it? Because you may now be realizing that all that work is not necessarily equating to getting fellowship spot or even interview. In this video, I'm going to go into all the steps that I took. I'm going to be breaking it down into two steps. The steps before the application season opens and the steps during application season opens. It's important that you stay tuned because the most important things that I'm going to discuss are the things that happen during the interview season. And for those of you who want to jump straight to that portion, I put a timestamp. You can just go straight to the... Okay, let's get to it. Order of importance, the things that I did before the application season opened was one, I got strong letters of recommendation. And I talk about this every single time. I talk about how to get letters of recommendation. Letters of recommendation for me was completely the biggest thing that I had. Everybody talked about my letters of recommendation. I did about six to eight weeks of rotation in my own program. So I got three letters of recommendation from my own program. And I went away to an affiliated institution and I also did one month of rotation in that institution and I got a letter of recommendation there. The key is you have to be very intentional. When I was approaching my letter writers, I had asked them before I even started rotation that my intention is to apply to cardiology and how do I get a strong letter? And they told me you know, what they expected from me and I just went ahead and did that stuff. Let me tell you what I did to get a strong letter of recommendation that most people do not do. And that is to keep a journal. And what does this mean? So anytime I was rotating with a preceptor, I kept a small journal of the things that heard during my rotation. Things that I occurred are things that are very subtle. Things that the patient had said, things that the nurses had said, things that my colleagues had said, things that even they themselves had said. For example, if a patient invites you to come see their family, or if a patient complimented you in front of your attending, or in my case, the patient had told the attendants that, oh, they love me and would like to follow me in the future, that kind of stuff. You write them down, you itemize them down in your Google Doc or journal so that each of your future letter writers has something specific that happened during their rotation that you document. When it's time to get your letter of recommendation, preferably three months before, you send them your CV, you send them your rough draft of a personal statement, and you send them that journal. That will help the letter writers write things that every other person is writing, plus the things that they probably had forgotten. So now your letter has depth. Now your letter is no longer a 7 over 10. Your letter is now a 10 over 10. That is what I did. And initially when I was doing it, honestly, I did it actively for about just one or two people. But then during the time for to send my letters of recommendation, I was able to sit down and just retrospectively recall and write them down and still send it to them. So for those of you who may have not written it at the time it happened, you can still just sit down and think back to the things that happened and write them down. Now also, I talked about rotating in an outside pro program. In that outside program, what I did was I tried to be very active, proactive during my during ward rounds when seeing patients. But also I came up with a research question and I was able to collaborate with the program director in that program. Such that by the time I had left, we were still doing research together and that you know led to good letters of recommendation. That also led to an interview. Those of you who don't have an in-house fellowship, once you go outside your institution, you have to try and establish a communication link because once you leave, they are likely to forget you if you don't have something that keeps that communication open. Okay, letters of recommendation, 10 over 10. Number two, research. Another big thing that influenced my match. And most people ask me a question, and actually this was one of the questions that I also had, what kind of research? So I had the privilege to talk to a lot of program directors and my understanding is that most programs rate original research higher than every other thing. I got other research you could do, case report, narrative review, systematic review and meta-analysis, but what the program actually likes, what the program actually ranks very high in terms of research is an original research. So what is an original research? An original research is something that you come up with the question yourself, you probably look for the data yourself, and then you answer that question and you take it from start to finish. That is an original research. And that was what helped me a lot. During my interview season, I kept talking about my research and the plans for the research, what's the next step for the research, but it was mostly circled and centered around original research. Number three, networking. And one of the things that I get every single time as an IMG is that you have to network. But the problem is nobody tells us how to network and how I was able to leverage networking was to use research in my networking. And how I did it was I will come up with a topic, I'll write the full manuscript and then I'll send it to a senior person in that field and have them give me feedback and start collaborating. So 
I used research and collaboration to form network and that was very helpful because by the time you apply you want to have people that you want to reach out to to just let them know that oh I've applied to your program I'm looking forward to interviewing them I recently was asked a question and the person asked me a question they said how did you come from a small community hospital to this big institution in Massachusetts how did you do that well I don't think a lot of people know the kind of work that goes into being an IMG applying for cardiology especially when you don't have an in-house fellowship you don't have big uh, program prestige name number four I'd applied for the US green card in the process of switching from a h1b to a green card so that in itself helped now i did not have a green card at that time but what i did was that i was able to let the programs know that okay i don't have a green card yet but the green card is on its way so at the time that i got my green card i was able to email programs and let them know being on a h1b causes a lot of constraints because you are limited in number of programs so for those of you on h1b i'll encourage you to try and start your process of switching to a green card i put a link down below it's all the checklist you need to know and what you need to do to get to a green card number five being a chief resident i've heard in the past that being a chief resident you know, adds to the color of your application but in my experience i don't think it added that much and during my interviews they had brought it up a few times but barely the things that we were more interested about was mostly letters of recommendation my research i think they were even more interested in my personal statement than me being a chief resident so i don't know how much it counts um people have said that it gets you visible but doesn't necessarily get you much. For me, I only consider being a chief resident if I didn't have to get an extra year. On a scale of one to 10, I think three or four by 10. This is the initial phase before the application season. You've done all these things, but the question is, after you hit submit to your ERAS application, what happens? How do you get interviews? One of the first things to do is to just understand that this is a very stressful period. So what I did was I personally just had colleagues who were in the same shoes and we personally just talked about it and you know, it's kind of like a therapy session. It's really, really intense because you put so much work and it doesn't seem like the work you put necessarily is the same with the amount of interviews or response you get. That's when you completely now understand that you truly are an IMG. And yeah, I found a group of friends and we had like a small group. We called ourselves from time to time, just kind of checked on ourselves. It's one of the most important things, you know. I will say that the next thing I did was I tracked, there's a Google sheet for cardiology. So I tracked the Google sheet and I found out, looked at the programs that I had sent out, the programs that had some openings, uh, did they sponsor visa, did they not sponsor visa? And based off of that information, I would decide if I would send them an email or not. So that brings me to the next thing I, I did. One of the most important things with the highest return of investment that helped me by far the most was self-advocacy. And that simply means looking for emails of people in the program and sending them cold emails. Now I put a link to the format of the exact emails that I sent to programs and I got a ton, I think I got, now I'm not exactly sure how much I how number is, I got about five to six interviews from that process alone. And what I did was I'll go to Frida.com and I'll look for the program director's email and I'll copy it and I'll send them an email. But I also try to send that email with my institutional email because using Gmail, it might get lost in their spam folder. So I, I didn't want to take that chance. I used my institutional email. I sent them that email that I, I put the link down below for the email format that I use. But generally speaking, what you are telling them is why you are interested in their program, the things that you've done and how that ties back into being a strong candidate for their program. IMG, if you're waiting for interviews, this is something that you will do at this time. And for me, I started, I think, at day 10, 10 days out of submission, my initial submission. That's when I started sending those emails. And I typically got replies within 48, 72 hours. I typically got replies with interviews. So another thing that I did was I reached out to some fellows. Now, I didn't reach out to so many fellows because I didn't know a lot of fellows, to be honest. But I got one interview from that process. I don't think I pursued that channel as much as I should have. I mainly focused on just sending emails to the program directors. Also tried to reach out to program chairs, but that was mostly on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, I, I got one interview from that process also. Even after all this thing, there is one thing that everybody can do in their current situation that is very, 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 very important. And that is attending conference within your state. Now, during the August, October period, there's, there's usually conferences happening now, usually state chapter ACCs. Now, the thing about state chapter ACCs is that program directors within that state usually convey in the early hours of that meeting. They usually have a program director meeting. So I would encourage every single person, look out for your own state chapter ACC and go there. Go early, find the program directors and network with them. That will help you a lot. And that personally helped me. And that will help you a lot. Because the program directors are there. They are mostly going to be in person. You will probably see some fellows and you may be lucky to just have a few of them and that will lead to a couple of interviews. Other conferences that happen around this time of the year, ASPC, that's the Association of Preventive Cardiology. I 
think they usually have conferences somewhere around August and, and also the HFSC, that's the Heart Failure Society of America, they usually have their conferences somewhere around September. So those conferences are very, very helpful that you can use as a platform to leverage networking in person. Additionally, for those of you who have mentors, I would encourage you to have them reach out to one program on your behalf. That will significantly increase your chance. Now, if you have three mentors, you can ask the three of them to reach out to three separate programs or if there's one program you're very interested in you can reach out to that program have all of them reach out to that program um does that help me i got one interview through that process just your mentor reaching out to programs now in my own situation i don't think i leverage that enough i probably should have you know all my mentors to reach out to different programs but for some reason i did not do that i think that will significantly increase your chances of interviewing a number of interviews so, and as someone who just recently matched one of the things i recently learned is that cardiology program directors actually pay attention to the program director email I didn't have first hand experience with that but i just realized that that is a very potent way that amgs use to get interviews and i think that in speaking with your program director if you have that cordial relationship just speaking with them and having them advocate for you in an email will go a long way you know? and also mock interviews now during the interview season you are anxious you're just going crazy one of the ways to calm your mind down is to do mock interviews with your co-applicants and the reason for this is that some programs will send you an interview but they only send you a couple of days most imgs will get the second or third wave of interview the slots are very limited i had to cancel one of my interviews and that is why i said i got 16 plus interviews i had to cancel one of my interviews because i had two interviews on the same day there was limited slot i could not proceed with one of the interviews so you should get ready and you should book your interviews as early as possible the mistakes that i made was booking you know two weeks out i'll take the date for two weeks out but down the road i realized that i started having lots of days that were clashing so i had to try to switch things around and it became very cumbersome so i had to cancel one interview so that is what i would advise you when you get an interview, select the earliest convenient date because you probably will get another interview in the future that you don't want clashing. You want to find a way to relax your nerves by getting prepared for the day that you get interviews. So I would highly encourage you to do this. This was a game changer. I didn't need to necessarily practice interviews because I was already practicing interviews before I got my interviews. So that's something that you should do. As you can see, I did not have the perfect CV. I did not come from a prestigious program. I was able to use the strategies, strategies to get seen, strategies to network, and strategies to get strong letters of recommendation. And I think that's exactly what you can do. Now, for those of you who are asking about how do you do original research, I put a link down below. You click on the link. For those of you who are currently applying, what is the biggest shock you just realized? Leave your comment in the comment section. And as usual, I'll see you in the next one.